Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, some key weekend takeaways from a pair of difficult losses for the Wolves, including Anthony Edwards' injury Friday night. We'll also peek ahead to the Knicks game on Monday night. We haven't seen the Knicks since early November. Will Ant return? What to expect out of New York and Tom Thibodeau's crew? It's all coming on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. Happy Monday, everybody. Hopefully, you had a great weekend and happy Timberwolves game day. The Wolves are in New York to take on the Knicks on Monday night. We'll talk about that at the end of the show. First, though, I want to talk all about key takeaways from the weekend, and I've got several. A big thank you off the top. For making Locked On Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find this show. You can also watch on the Locked On Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can follow on Twitter at Locked On T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right, so we'll set a pair of losses this weekend. Of course, the Friday night loss was the more difficult of the two uh, at the Bulls in that it was a double overtime loss. Anthony Edwards gets hurt in the first quarter. So it's still a very winnable game for the Wolves down the stretch. And then Saturday, the Wolves are actually competitive against the Toronto Raptors. Um, you know, obviously, Sands Ant, Sands Garland Anthony Towns, uh, you know, long injury list um, on Saturday. The Wolves are competitive leading towards the end of the third quarter and then ultimately lose by 15. So I want to do kind of overarching key takeaways. And there's a couple that I'm going to key in on more on one game versus the other. But um, let, let's do that instead of, you know, I don't want to do a full Saturday post game pod. I didn't do a full post game pod for either one of those games. We did the live postcast on Friday. So I, I do want to just kind of hit some high points and low points, I guess, from the weekend. So um, looking back to Friday. In that game, the Anthony Edwards injury is, of course, the the headline, uh, the the depressing headline, the the low light from the game on Friday, right? Um, but even without Ant, the Wolves actually played pretty well, except for late game execution, um, which I mean that's oversimplifying things a little. But late game execution was the biggest issue, and Marty and I broke this down entirely on the uh, on the live postcast. If you want to relive that, it's the last audio. Uh, the, if you're listening on an audio platform, it's the last episode in your feed uh, or the, the videos over at Lockdown Sports Minnesota on YouTube. But we talked about end of regulation. The Wolves are up a couple points. You know, they have the ball. Gobert misses a pair of free throws. Then the Bulls get an eight second violation. The Wolves get the ball again up to with 46 seconds left. They get a really tough end of shot clock three for Mike Conley that misses. And then after the uh, the Bulls tie the game, the Wolves call a timeout. They don't even get a shot off in, what was it, 20.1 seconds on the clock, clock at the end of the game Friday. Kyle Anderson ends up double dribbling before he would have not gotten a shot off anyway, but they call the double dribble with fractions of a second left on the clock. The Wolves don't get a shot off. At the end of the first overtime, they do get a shot off a, a McDaniels attempt, um, but that's only after having the ball in their hands with 20 seconds left. Torian Prince turns it over in transition going the other way when all they needed to do is avoid that, avoid a turnover right? Make the Bulls foul you. The Wolves turn it over. It ends up going to a second overtime. And then with about a minute and a half left, the, the Bulls kind of pull away from Minnesota. Um, so late game execution is an issue on Friday night. And it's something that, frankly, it's it's been an issue kind of on and off all season. Turns out having isolation guys like Ant and, and even D'Angelo Russell, who could get a shot off at any point, that a lot of times helps in crunch time. You know, a coach could call, call a good play. But it's harder to execute. We've seen the Wolves defensively in crunch time be fantastic, which, of course, this all just kind of fits. And in, in, this has always been my theory on crunch time. It pretty much just amplifies what you're good and bad at normally, right? We we talk about it like it's this mystical thing. And, the, and, and to be clear, I do think that there are players individually who are better or worse in big situations. I, I do think that's possible. Um, however, 
volume matters, right? Like you go back and look at Kobe stats or whatever, you know, in terms of a player who is seen as a clutch player, but you know, it's more because you remember the wins. You don't remember the losses, the missed shots, et cetera. Right. Um, in terms of the, in terms of the team, the Wolves have been a better defensive team than offensive team. So of course they're going to be better defensively in crunch time than offensively. And we saw that. Um, but like, for instance, the end of the first overtime on Friday, Nas Reed blocks Zach Levine at the rim. The Wolves have the ball 20 seconds left up two, and then Prince turns it over and the Bulls score in transition on the way back, which is a fitting end to, I mean, it wasn't the end to the game, but that's kind of the Wolves season in a nutshell, right? You have a great defensive possession. You turn it over in transition on a sloppy play offensively. You give up a bucket in transition going the other way and you ultimately lose that game. It's kind of a microcosm of, of some of the Wolves' biggest issues this season. You throw an offensive rebound in there, I guess, for the opponent, and and that would have that would kind of be the uh, all of it, right? The, the the Mount Rushmore of Timberwolves' issues this year, if you will. Um, also on Friday, uh, Rudy Gobert was fantastic. I mean, he was a little bit of foul trouble, really good. Jade McDaniel's awesome at the end of the game. I mean, he stepped up big. It took him a minute to kind of get his sea legs. I think after Ant got hurt, he got more involved as the game went on. What did he finish with on Friday? Um, I've got it right here. He finished with 25 points on 7 of 15 shooting, four made threes, six rebounds, four assists. McDaniels did on Friday. He was fantastic in that game. Uh, and I want to talk a lot more about McDaniels here in just a minute. Mike Conley was really good, especially early in that game. Kyle Anderson on Friday night uh, had a triple-double. Um, they had guys step up against a decent, you know, a decent Bulls team, a full strength Bulls team. I mean, Chicago was six games under 500 coming into that game, but we can all agree that they've underachieved in a big way this year. Um, but the Wolves handled a full strength Bulls team minus Anthony Edwards for the vast majority of that game extremely well on Friday night. The biggest negative takeaway points of the paint. They were a minus 10, which is, you know, uh, you can't let that happen. And, and especially, I mean, Gobert was healthy. I know that, like we're still talking about a relatively undersized Wolves team with no Carl Anthony Towns, right? Um, but still, you're minus 10 in points in the paint. They held their own on the glass. Wolves were actually a plus three overall in rebounding and only gave up six offensive rebounds to the Bulls. So that was good. The bad thing was the bench shooting. Uh, the bench on Friday night was was not good. Um, total, total, the Wolves bench shot 15 of 39 from the field. That's 38.5%, and it felt worse than that. There's just a lot of missed open shots, especially early in that game. Nikhil Alexander Walker struggled from outside the arc. As a as a whole, the bench was four for eighteen from outside the arc. Four for eighteen from outside the arc, and again shot thirty eight and a half percent total from the from the floor. The bench did. Torian Prince had a rough game. Actually, Torian Prince had a rough weekend. That's an overall weekend takeaway. Is Torian Prince's Torian Prince's post All Star break struggles have really continued. Nas was disappointed on Friday. He turned it around in a big way. Saturday, Dorm McLaughlin was his steady self in both games. To kill Alexander Walker also did not have a fantastic weekend. Um, I mean, we could talk about combined stats for Na and uh, in Prince between the two games, but I, I don't really want to frame it that way. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, they both played poorly Friday and Saturday. And those are your bench wings, right? I mean, Austin Rivers played some, some bit minutes on uh, on Friday. He played seven minutes as part of the rotation, did not play on Saturday. He's, of course, got the, uh, I think, back spasms. So he's kind of questionable coming into each game. Did not play well Friday. Didn't see the floor at all Saturday at any point. Um, only player on the bench to not see the floor. So you're talking about your two bench wings, now Alexander Walker and Torian Prince. That's probably my biggest overarching takeaway between the two games was that they struggled. Uh, they, they really struggled. Prince on Friday night, two of eight shooting, four points, a couple of turnovers. Alexander Walker on Friday, four of 10 shooting, two of six outside the arc, 12 points, played a little better, certainly played better than he did on Wednesday. Remember, he had that terrible shooting night. He bounced back, made his first three on Friday, but then didn't have a strong finish. On Saturday, Prince joins the starting lineup and is one of seven shooting, 0 of four outside the arc, three turnovers in 30 minutes for Prince. Off the bench, Alexander Walker has four points on two of eight shooting, misses all three of his three-point attempts, was a minus 14 for the game. So, um, Prince was in a bench wing Saturday. He started, but those two guys have to perform better. Um, you know, Jalen Noel's still out, wasn't playing well when he was healthy. No Anthony Edwards. Like, you need more out of those guys. You need more out of those guys. And we saw more Josh Mine at Saturday. He entered the rotation. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But I mean, like, we're going to see if Ant doesn't play Monday, we need to see even more Josh Mine. Maybe we see some window more. Like, I know he hasn't looked great in limited minutes, but uh, you need to have some punch there. And if Prince isn't going to give it to you at all, 
And if Alexander Walker is not going to be consistent and, and we thought there might be some regression to the mean, at least in terms of his three point shooting from how good he was right after the trade about a month ago, uh, we're seeing that now in a, in a pretty loud way. All right. Some additional takeaways from the weekend, a couple, I want to focus in a little bit more on the Saturday game since it's fresher. So we'll do that. And then we'll also preview Wolves Knicks here in just a moment. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at Prize Picks. On Monday night against the New York Knicks, I would take, I don't know, pick a Knicks player, honestly, and, and take the over on rebounds. The Knicks are a good rebounding team. The Wolves are not. I mean, you could go Julius Randle. You could go, uh, I don't know, probably Julius Randle's your best bet. You go Mitchell Robinson. Pick a Knicks player. Pick the over on rebounds. Uh, hopefully the Wolves win, but I don't think they're going to look great on the glass. It's just what I would be most concerned about. We'll talk more about that last segment. If you're wondering how prize picks works, it's pretty easy. You pick two to six players that they'll score more or less than their prize picks projection in any category, not just points, rebounds, assists, blocks, uh, et cetera. You can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. You're not competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. That, of course, includes the NBA as well as college sports. Um, not today, but later this week. That would be a, a, a fun one. MLB as well. That season kicks off next week. Regular season does. NHL is ongoing. Um, any sport, though, you can find it there. You can make your entry in less than 60 seconds. Just download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, they'll give you $50. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. All right, a couple key takeaways from Saturday's game against the Raptors. Uh, of course, no Ant. He was actually questionable on Saturday, which was um, a surprise coming off of how bad that ankle sprain looked on Friday night. By the way, he's also questionable for Monday's game against the Knicks. On Saturday, I actually thought the Wolves played fairly well up until late in the third quarter, and things really fell apart quickly. Um, they, they really snowballed. The, the Wolves competed. They were in a good spot. They were actually up three points with less than four minutes to play in the third quarter. Turnovers, et cetera, were kind of the, the story at the end of the third. Um, the offense on Saturday, predictably, with no Anthony Edwards, and of course still no Carl Anthony Towns, had no flow. Um, we're talking about, like, I don't know. The, the Raptors did a good job of early in the game kind of throwing a wrench in things by mixing in some zone. And the Wolves, I think the easiest way to say it is the Wolves just didn't have the dynamic ball handlers slash guys willing and able to drive seams in the defense, which is huge when you're playing a zone. Like everybody talks about, you need to make open jumpers. You need to make threes when the opponents play in the zone. That's a hundred percent true, but you also have to be comfortable driving seams. And then, you know, uh, also you need to have cutters, right? Like just general movement, whether it's ball movement, player movement, that's how you beat a zone. You have to have guys again, willing and able to drive seams, willing and able to make it take threes, take and make threes. The wolves didn't have either. I mean, nobody was really attacking off the dribble. We saw early in the game, you know, Nas was. So, you know, I don't want to pretend like he wasn't. Nas was. Jordan McLaughlin had some good minutes in this game. Uh, Jade McDaniels had a couple of really big minutes, a couple of big moments. But if Ant doesn't play Monday, the Wolves have to get Jade McDaniels involved more. In fact, if you go back and watch, this is probably my biggest takeaway from Saturday. Um, so I just watched McDaniels. I watched back McDaniels makes from Saturday. I should probably watch all of his attempts. And actually, if you just watch the whole game. The Wolves on the offensive end of the floor in the first quarter, McDaniels didn't really do much for the first five minutes. He wasn't super involved. And then they ran a couple of dribble handoffs, one, one from um, opposite. What am I trying to say? From opposite sides of the floor. So him coming from the right side and him coming from the left side. First, he came from the right side, took the dribble handoff from Rudy Gobert, and drives baseline on the left side of the floor, gets makes a tough basket. A couple of possessions later, I think it was, he comes from the opposite side of the floor and gets that poster dunk, just a, just a massive dunk. Um, I think it might have been over Scotty Barnes. I can't remember who was over on the right side of the rim um, after coming from the left side of the floor, taking the handoff, darting to the rim, and dunking. Um, the Wolves need to do more of that with Jaden McDaniels, more dribble handoffs. And I, I screamed this at the top of my lungs last year about Ant, that I wanted Ant 
in dribble handoff situations, I know it's effectively a pick and roll, but it's a little different, right? If you're, if you're playing the angles correctly, you come off of those dribble handoffs and you could go straight to the rim. It's, it's essentially just a, you're diving at the rim. Your angle is much more aggressive in pick and roll. There's more time to be decisive. And by that, I mean, indecisive. Um, and Ant has gotten much better. So it's less important. I think now with Ant, McDaniels hasn't operated a ton. Like he's operated a little in pick and roll, right? But it's always been Ant or D'Angelo Russell or even Carl Anthony Towns or Jalen Noel. It's guys that other guys that are the ones operating. McDaniels was the fifth option for each of the last couple of years. And for the first part of this season too, when D'Lo was on the team and Cat was healthy, McDaniels was option number five in the offense. He wasn't being asked to operate pick and roll. Dribble handoffs are similar, but usually the, the action there is get to the rim. Take the handoff and get to the rim, or take the handoff and take a tough pull up three, right? If you're if you're D Lo or Ant. Um, probably less so if you're McDaniels, although I know that the shooting numbers have been really, especially the last couple of days. Four threes made Friday, four threes made Saturday. But with McDaniels, just go to the rim. So we see him get that massive dunk. He doesn't make any more shots off of dribble handoffs the rest of the game. And again, I have to go back and watch and see the frequency with which the Wolves ran that. But those two plays in the first quarter were both so dynamic, and the Wolves got exactly what they wanted. For McDaniels to only have 18 points on 14 shots and still be four of six on three pointers, that means he was he was two of eight on two point attempts, only attempted two free throws. And I think it's a combination of opportunity and also again familiarity with with trying to make something happen in an offensive action where you are the feature, right? You're not the because so much of what McDaniels ended up doing from a points perspective was catch and shoot threes anyway. 12 of his 18 points were catch and shoot threes. Um, you know, his other six, well, two were that baseline. Shot I just mentioned off dribble handoff. The other was the dunk off dribble handoff. And I don't recall what the third two-point basket was, but he only had three all game. Um, didn't turn the ball over at all. Generally played well. Had one assist, no turnovers. Um, I think on Monday, assuming there's no Anthony Edwards, the Wolves have to get McDaniels involved more. By the way, I pulled his, uh, you do this at, at a number of places. So B-Ball Index has, uh, has play types. Um, that's a subscription service. They do a really, really good job. But you look at his, uh, they don't actually have dribble handoffs separated out. So I want to pull NBA.com's there for in just a minute. But his pick and roll ball handling points per possession, according to B-Ball Index, is 0.85, which is 72nd percentile, who grades out as a B. So it's fine. Like, he's not bad in, um, in pick and roll ball handling situations. According to NBA.com, though, slash stats, NBA.com slash stats, in only 0.3 possessions per game, so very low frequency. In fact, just 3% of McDaniel's possessions are used as a in dribble handoffs. But he's out, he's got 1.29 points per possession in those situations, which actually would be best on the team. Now, the Wolves only have three guys who, who do that more than one possession per game. Mike Conley, which by the way, he by the way, over a point per possession, which is which is good. Um, D'Angelo Russell and Anthony Edwards are all over a possession per game in dribble handoff. And Edwards is actually the worst of those in terms of uh, points per possession, 0.83. McDaniels, again, in very small sample, very limited action in terms of taking dribble handoffs, 1.29 points per possession would be best on the team. And that should include uh, Saturday. Yeah, it does include Saturday's game. Um, let's see more of that. And and you're asking McDaniels to do one thing. Like, you're not asking too much. Get the dribble handoff, get to the rim. And if you get stopped, we're seeing him be more comfortable with those kickouts, with those passes when he's got the ball in his hands. It's just, it's it's an opportunity, in my opinion, for him to have a better angle, to be athletic, take advantage of the angle, and and less opportunity to be indecisive, which you can see sometimes in pick and roll. And of the guys on the floor, McDaniel's the most dynamic player. Kyle Anderson's a nice player. You want him initiating offense. He's been so important for the Wolves this year. He's not dynamic. Mike Conley, I same analysis. Very important to what they do. Played well over the weekend for the most part. Not dynamic. Um, Torian Prince can be. In fact, that's another one of my notes from Saturday is they need more out of him, not just because he was in the starting lineup. He didn't play well Friday either, but especially with no Anthony Edwards. I mean, he's got to be more aggressive. He's got to be more effective. He's got to make open shots. He's got to, he, in theory, can create off the dribble for himself and others. We've seen Prince do that in the past. He was asked to do it as part of the bench unit some last year, earlier this season. He did not play well. That leaves Jane McDaniels and Rudy Gobert. Gobert needs somebody else to get him involved. He's not going to do it on his own. And he was okay. He played really well Friday. He was okay on Saturday against a really tough Raptors front line. 
McDaniels has to be the guy. Like, unless you're going to rely entirely on Nas Reed off the bench in limited minutes because he's playing behind Gobert, or you're going to rely on Nikhil Alexander. I mean, like Josh Minot's not initiating his own offense at this stage. It's got to be McDaniels and it's got to be dribble handoffs. It's got to be yes, pick and rolls. Um, it's just got to be finding those opportunities and run a couple. I would say the first couple of possessions, run some plays to get him some open threes. He's such a good open three point shooter right now. He made four threes on Friday. What was he four of nine, four of six on Saturday for the season? I lost it. I was going to say for the season, he's over. He's got to be over 40% at this point. McDaniels has to be from outside the arc. Um, 39.2% for the season from three. McDaniels is a good open three-point shooter, catch-and-shoot shooter. Um, you know, run a couple plays for him early in the game. Get McDaniels some catch-and-shoot opportunities. Get him feeling confident. And then run some of those dribble handoffs. By the way, catch-and-shoot threes this year, 38.4%. 68th percentile, which is a B-league lot. So he's good, right? He's openness rating, 81%, or excuse me, 81st percentile. And openness rating on B-ball index is just a value, a Z-score value for the estimate of how open their average three-point attempts are. That's an A-. minus. McDaniels is shooting open threes. It's part of the reason his numbers, his percentage is so high. Get him some open looks. And of course, I understand that Anthony Edwards creates a lot of those, but go back and watch McDaniels three-point attempts Saturday. They're all pretty open. Get him some open looks early in the game and then allow him to create off dribble handoffs and even in pick and roll to initiate some Wolves offense because that's the only shot, frankly, you have against a solid defensive team and a really good offensive team against the Knicks in the Knicks on Monday night. All right, speaking of the Knicks, I want to preview what they've been up to, what Tibbs and crew have been doing. Uh, so I want to preview that matchup here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at Nissan. Nissan's most electric player of the week is brought to you by the all-new all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. I know I just said Kyle Anderson's not dynamic, but he's the electric player of the week. He's got to be. He had a pair of triple doubles for the Wolves going back to last Monday. So we'll call it, we'll call it eight, eight-ish days. Um, Kyle Anderson over the last week, 13 points, nine assists, eight and a half rebounds per game. So pretty close to averaging a triple double. He only had, uh, what did he have? Five rebounds against, or excuse me, five assists against the Raptors. So that kind of suppressed that a little bit. But again, 13, nine, and We'll round up 13, nine and nine for Kyle Anderson over the last week, shooting just under 46% from the field. I, you know, the Nissan Aria is electric. It's brilliantly fierce. It's fiercely elegant. A lot of times I've been able to say ant is all those things, but honestly, Kyle Anderson's passing and his basketball IQ and his ability to control pace. It's elegant. It's, it's stunning. Uh, it's, it's, it's just incredible. Kyle Anderson has been really important to the wolves last week. Uh, again, brilliant. Fierce, stunningly powerful. All those things also apply to the Nissan Aria. The 2023 Nissan Aria packs pin you to your seat power and premium intelligence all in one EV. The all new, all electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at nissanusa.com. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is also brought to us by our friends at Built Bar. The Built March Madness bracket is here. We know you have a favorite bar or puff. And now's your time to make a count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know, I'll be voting for anything with cookie dough, anything with brownie, brownie batter, um, etc. I mean, if, if you have a favorite, get over there. You'll be voting for that bar too. support your team, support your bar or puff. And when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky locked on listeners will get a free box of built. Not only that, but locked up one locked on fan will win a 12 month subscription to built to have built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. You got to try Built. Built is the best protein bar ever. Seriously, they're so amazing, you won't even think they're good for you. What makes Built Bars and Puffs so good? Well, for starters, they're all high in protein, low in sugar, and covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. Run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March. So hop in and support your pick. All right, breaking down Wolves Knicks on Monday night. Uh, the Knicks have been playing, I mean, well overall. They've had a really good season, right? They're what forty-two and thirty coming into play on Monday night. Uh, they had a little bit of a rough stretch. They lost consecutive games. They lost at home to the Hornets, 
on the road to Sacramento and on the road to the Clippers. So no shame in those losses. But most recently, they've won three in a row. They've beaten the Lakers, Blazers, and then the Nuggets. So they're on the second game of this homestand. And also prior to that three-game losing streak, by the way, the Knicks had a nine-game winning streak, which was mostly against the Eastern Conference. They mixed in some wins there against good teams, though. I mean, the Nets are still playing well. They beat the Celtics during that win streak. Uh, they beat the Jazz to start it. Um, so it's a... The, the Knicks have just been a really good team this year. I mean, there's really no other way to slice it. And Julius Randle had, has had a nice season, a little bit of a bounce back. Uh, Tom Thibodeau, of course, has done a fantastic job with the Knicks overall. Uh, and as is often with Tibbs teams, team player, excuse me, people in general assume, probably teams and players too, assume that the Knicks or that Tibbs teams are just really good defensively. And they've been good defensively. They're They're very middle of the pack. They're currently 15th in defensive rating at basketball reference, but they're the fifth best offensive team in terms of efficiency league wide this year. They're fifth in offensive rating. Um, they play at a slow pace. They don't score a ton of points per game. Um, they're only 14th in points per game, but because they're so efficient because they can dictate pace, um, they are, they are fantastic as an offensive team. They're actually dead last at assists per game. Um, you know, they're, they're not doing a ton in transition. They're not, um, they're not like a fly up and down. They don't play like the Wolves, I guess, is is maybe the best way to say it. They're last in the steals per game, last in assists per game. But they are, the Knicks are 10th in free throw rate. They're second in offensive rebound rate. They're eighth in three-point attempts per game and 10th in three-point attempt rate. So they are shooting threes. They are getting good looks. Um, they are getting to the free throw line. They're effective on the glass. Um, this is just a, a solid Knicks team. And, of course, Julius Randle has been a big part of that. Uh, Jalen Brunson, of course, the free agent acquisition there in New York. Um, you know, Mitchell Robinson's a really, really good player in, and is is finally healthy. Um, it, this could be a tough game for the Wolves. The last time the Wolves and Knicks played each other was way back in November. This was actually game 11 of the season for the Wolves, so they were still healthy at the time. And nothing went to plan. Like, it's a weird box score if you, box score, excuse me, if you go back and look at it. Cat had 25, 13, and 7 and shot 9 of 12 from the floor. I don't know why he only got 12 shot attempts, but he was really good. Nobody else really played well. D'Lo had 14 on 12 shots. Anthony Edwards only had 16 on 14 shots. Jade McDaniels fouled out in 17 minutes in that game. Now, knock on wood, it's been a while since we've seen those foul troubles to that extent crop up for McDaniels. Remember, this was like early in the season – McDaniels had these games like that Thunder game where he looked like he was an all-star against OKC. There were a couple of those mixed in with these foul out in less than 20 minute games. This was a foul out in less than 20 minute game for Jade McDaniels. 0 of 2 outside the arc, six points on six shots, fouls out in 17 minutes. The bench was nondescript for the Wolves. Nas had a nice game. Uh, that was kind of it. Austin Rivers had nine points. Jalen Noel had eight in 11 minutes. Like uh, um, it was a minus 19 in those 11 minutes. This was just a, a bad game for the Wolves. They got down nine at the end of the first quarter. They were a minus 15 in the second quarter. So they were down 24 points at halftime, ended up losing by 13 in this one at home against the Knicks. And again, game 11. So the Knicks at the time were five and five after this game. The Wolves were five and six. On the Knicks side of things, Julius Randle had a, had a field day. 31 points, made eight threes in this game. He had nine made shots. Eight of them were threes. He also had eight rebounds, turned it over five times. Brunson had 23 and eight. RJ Barrett had 22 and five in this game against the wolves. And it was, it was the, if you will, the next big three um, that really did the wolves in. And that's obviously who you got to look out for it. One of the ant is listed as questionable, but if he doesn't play something I didn't talk about related to Saturday and also Friday missing ants defense, like the obvious one is the offense. Cause there's just, isn't much dynamic individual go get me a bucket type talent talent, excuse me, the ability to initiate offense dynamically, right? With no ant, you're just missing that. You're also missing a really good perimeter defender, a really, really good perimeter defender. Now it's just McDaniels. Like who else are you relying on? It's Nikhil Alexander Walker. It's Josh Minot. Like those are the uh, Austin Rivers. If he can play and you want him to guard, a, you know, put him out there against a ball handler, like who's going to slow down. Uh, I mean, you're going to have like, what are you going to do with McDaniels? How are you going to pick your spots? Uh, Mike Conley is going to have to try and guard Jalen Brunson. I think you're going to see Alexander Walker do a lot of that. Torian Prince in theory, but he's struggled on both ends of the floor. So you're going to be relying on, on, um, I mean, those guys, right? It's Conley. It's the Alexander Walker. It's Torian Prince. It's obviously McDaniels. 
McDaniels can't get into foul trouble in this game. But you also have to deal with Randall, Brunson, um, and RJ Barrett. Like that's that's three guys you have to you have to deal with. And last time out for the Knicks, Brunson against the Nuggets, this was a six point win over Denver. I mean, Denver's Denver's the best team in the West, right? Brunson had 24 and five. RJ Barrett had 21 points. Julius Randle had only 20 and seven and wasn't super efficient. Um, but like those are the guys you're gonna have to deal with. And the Wolves just don't have enough players defensively. My biggest concern besides that, besides McDaniel's foul trouble and a lack of perimeter defense, would be rebounding. The Knicks are the number two offensive rebounding team in the league by percentage. The Timberwolves continue to be bad. They're up to 27th in defensive rebound rate. They were 28th for a really long time. But still, they they only grab 74% of available defensive rebounds. The Knicks grab 28% of offensive rebounds chances. That's a really bad combination. Um, and going back and looking at the first time the Wolves played the Knicks, they gave up nine offensive rebounds to the Knicks, and the Wolves were a minus four on the glass. So rebounding to me, so perimeter defense is number one, um, and having the ability to slow down these half-court sets because the Bulls, or excuse me, the Knicks aren't going to kill you in transition. You have to be able to stop the ball in the half-court and stop R.J. Barrett um, and stop, um, my mind just went blank, R.J. Barrett and stop Jalen Brunson. Uh, that's the most important thing. Number two would be rebounding the basketball, defensive rebounding specifically. The Knicks are also good on the defensive glass, by the way. But you're more concerned about those second chance opportunities. If you get the initial stop, the Knicks are going to wear you down on the offensive glass. And, and that, to me, I'm afraid we're going to look up. We're going to see Mitchell Robinson with six offensive rebounds, Julius Randle with four offensive rebounds, and the Knicks with, as a team, like 12, 14 offensive rebounds. That's my fear for this game. So that and perimeter defense are the two biggest keys for me. And if the Wolves can speed up the pace, the more possessions, the better against a team like the Knicks because the Knicks have a really efficient offense. The Wolves won't. If Anthony Edwards does not play, the Wolves will not have an efficient offense, and they need to find a way to to score um, in so, some way, shape, or form in this game. Um, all right, that's all we've got for you here today. We will do the live postcast with Marnie Gellner. We'll be back at that tonight on Lockdown Sports Minnesota. It's a 7 p.m. tip, so we'll be live eh, roughly 10, 15, depending on the time the game finishes. Um, but it'll be a, uh, excuse me, it's a 6.30 tip because it's at New York. So it's 6.30 tip, so I guess it'll be it'll be more like 9.45 or so Central that will go live on Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube. We'll, of course, post that audio to this feed. If you're listening anywhere to the Locked On Wolves audio, we'll post that after the fact. A big thank you to those that do make Locked On Wolves your first listen every day. This show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked On T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, the Locked On Wolves podcast is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Now you can make your second listen today, the Lockdown Game to Game NBA podcast. Every moment, every top performance, and every result. Lockdown Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Lockdown can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Lockdown NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. Once again, I'm Bed Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.